three. So welcome to lesson seven, manipulating the genome. Uh, the last lesson we looked at how gene controlled exp or gene expression is controlled. And now we're going to look at some means with which we understand how that genetic or that genome expression can be in some way, shapes and form controlled. Because when you think about the genome as a whole, you have to remember there are some aspects that need to be taken into consideration. And, th and that is that it's the whole set of that organism's DNA. The sequence genome is the nucleotides essentially from the absolute beginning to the absolute end, those A, T, Cs, and Gs. Every single one of them, the exact order that they're in, start to finish. So the reason why we want to understand the sequence of uh, any and all genomes is that it allows for us to engineer some aspects. As many of you are looking at your projects uh, or your assignments with regards to genetic engineering, you're looking at the production of new genes or alterations of a genome of something by changing its nucleotide order. So substituting or inserting or removing different sequences and genes. And it's interesting to think about the reasons why we do that because one of the first examples of genetic engineering of a sort was the use of bacteria to make human insulin. So in certain types of diabetes, when you look at the need for insulin and their inability of the people with that type of diabetes to produce insulin, they need to get it from an external source. And insulin is quite hard to manufacture in a non, with a non-use of any type of bacteria or genetically modified component. So the human genome that contains the gene that is responsible for producing insulin. So when you think about that, um, when you think about that operon or those groups of genes that are responsible for producing insulin, that gene can be removed, combined with a plasmid DNA or a recombinant and create a recombinant DNA, a combination of human and bacterial DNA. It can be popped into via transgenic bacterium and that gets popped into that bacteria and that plasmid containing that insulin gene is able to then propagate through that population of bacteria and ultimately those bacteria will eventually start to produce and secrete the exact same insulin that human beings need. So recall, a plasmid is a small circular bacterial DNA. Recombinant DNA is DNA from two different sources, in this case, human, and in this case, other case, bacteria. So why use bacteria for this purpose? Well, it's important to understand that they can transform easily. Remember that transformation replication method, they can pick up that DNA quite easily from plasmids, and they also reproduce quite quickly. So this insulin that is produced by bacteria can then be removed, purified, and given to patients, and that insulin is absolutely indistinguishable from the insulin that our bodies produce. So when you think about the medical marvels and the potential for the medical marvels as a result of our ability to, to manipulate genomes, uh, they, they can be quite endless. So the tools with which we use for genetic engineering can be quite interesting. I had a conversation with one student over the weekend about restriction enzymes. They're also called endonucleases. They are responsible for isolating and cutting out a very specific DNA section in a very specific location as a result of a very specific base sequence. So it's, it's an absolutely specialized component of evolution. And it, it calls this specific base sequence the recognition site. And they are found naturally in prokaryotes. And it's interesting to think about the nature of why prokaryotes would need this. And, and when you go off to study any type of viral genetics or viral studies in undergraduate, you'll start to be able to connect the ideas of prokaryotes needing these restriction enzymes or endonucleases uh, as a defense mechanism. And we instead harness them to kind of remove specific components of DNA out so we can add in specific DNA components. So the cuts produce either, um, oh, sorry, the, the aspect of, of DNA that makes this useful or makes this uh, functional is the idea that DNA is palindromic, right? When you think of the word race car, it's the same forwards as it is backwards, right? And this palindromic nature, this palindromic nature allows the enzyme to cut both strands and it can produce what's called these sticky and blunt ends. And as a result of that, we can start to um, mix and match some sequences in some parts as a result of 
of this uh, restriction enzyme. And just a little note in terms of the cuts, they happen on that DNA's backbone, that ribose backbone. And it's interesting to think that uh, it's utilized, in, ba in bacteria it's utilized as a defense mechanism, but we harness it to kind of add and attach and remove specific sequences. So these blunt ends and these sticky ends that are produced as a result of cutting it can then be utilized in different ways. So blunt ends, they form when the restriction enzyme cuts straight across that DNA strand. So the hydrogen bonds remain, hydrogen bonds remain, making these more difficult to use in genetic engineering. So these blunt ends aren't quite useful because it cuts it straight down the middle and it doesn't really provide too much use other than potentially breaking down DNA that may or may not be bad. So these blunt ends, not so helpful, but these sticky ends, they occur when restriction enzymes cut in a zigzag pattern and it's across both strands. So note, there are many bases that no longer have hydrogen bonds. And as a result of that, again, the cuts in the sugar phosphate backbone, as a result of those cuts being made, where they have absolutely no hydrogen bonds, you can start to see that this region, oops, too big. You can start to see that this region and this region are allowed to form new bonds with other DNA sequences or other DNA sets that have had similar sticky ends produced. So now you start to get to uh, the point of where you can look at that aspect of recombinant DNA because we've created these sticky ends that will want to form hydrogen bonds with its complementary base pair analogs. And what follows afterwards in that DNA sequence, in this case, we'll look at this component. Well, that can change, right? That can change. Those sticky ends can be created at many beginnings of many different genes of many different operons within many different sequences. So you can start to see that there is potential to mix and match some aspects of that genome code. Another aspect with which we can manipulate genomes specifically is something called DNA ligase. And recall that that ligase is used to glue together those Okazaki fragments. So once those sticky ends have been produced, we can now use this DNA ligase that we recognize helps form those Okazaki fragments into a proper full strand of DNA. They, that, you know, it's, it's really utilizing that phosphodiester bond that we studied in unit one to, to kind of reseal up that genome and, and give that backbone back, that full backbone back to the full structure of DNA. So in genetic engineering, there, those are used to, the DNA ligase is used to rejoin DNA fragments that were created by that restriction enzyme. And it's in, again, it's interesting to, to think about it in the sense that that same restriction enzyme that is used on each of those genome codes that DNA backbone as well as that DNA insert, it allows for that sticky end to connect. That ligase will reform those bonds as a result. And we can now start to combine plasmids with a specific gene of interest. And that phosphodiester bond is reformed as a result of DNA ligase. And so now we can start to cut pieces out of DNA that we want to insert into a plasmid and then utilize that plasmid. So, what is a plasmid, if you don't recall from grade 11 biology? It's a small circular DNA that's found in bacteria. They replicate independently of the chromosomal DNA within that bacteria. And they can move between different cells. And I'm talking about with regards to within that prokaryotic uh, population. These plasmids or other recombinant DNA have been designed specifically to transfer specific genes to another cell. And these are called vectors. These vectors can move between cells and as a result of that movement, allow for extreme amounts of DNA information to be shared between different cells. So these plasmids are transferred to that host cell, which will make the protein of interest from the genes that have been inserted. And this allows for that transcribe, uh, the tr 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 to transcribe the plasmid DNA and make proteins from it. So, the mechanisms of prokaryotic cells that allow for this is recall that that genetic information just hangs out in its cytosol, right? So anytime you in, input a new piece of genetic information, that bacteria 
will treat that plasmid as its own genetic information and then make those proteins based off of what that genetic information is asking for it to do. So we can essentially hijack a bacteria cell or a prokaryotic cell to kind of make things that we need it to make. So in order to harness this correctly, we have to create what's called restriction maps. And these restriction maps were created by scientists to help indicate that restriction enzyme as well as the distances between those sites. So we think about the recognition sites, the recognition sites of a restriction enzyme. And we want to really be able to determine the distance between these sites counted in base pairs. And it's the table that we looked at above. But those recognition sites are really going to help us understand several things. So when we think about why it's important to understand where those restriction enzymes will cut specifically, it, it needs to be taken into consideration that we're going to select the best plasmid as well as the best restriction enzyme for a very specific gene of interest. So we want a plasmid to have those specific sequences, that genome code, that coincide with the restriction enzymes recognition sites, as well as to have that gene of interest that we're trying to insert into a plasmid. We also want that plasmid or that uh, gene of interest to have a similar recognition site. And this allows for us to, again, cut and paste different genetic chunks into those plasmids. So it's important to recognize that plasmid digestion takes place. That restriction enzyme cuts at those specific areas, and it cuts that plasmid's genetic information out using that restriction enzyme. So in this diagram here, I have the hind three digestion, which cuts at that one specific spot. Okay, I have that hind three that cuts at one specific spot. Then we have the echo R1, which also cuts at those two spots that I've highlighted in red. And then we have what's called a double digestion, which means that it's cut out two specific separate chunks as a result of three cuts that have been made. And this allows for us to remove some components that might not be uh, useful slash might kind of interfere with what we want to add on. But now we've created sticky ends essentially at these two points for us to add in any type of genome information we want. So that's effectively it in terms of this lesson. I have an activity on the next page for you to all take a look at. It requires you to read through tutorial one, section 8.1, pages 370 to 372. And then you can complete some of these practice questions when looking at how restriction enzymes work and how those different and specific restriction enzymes work. Uh, so I'm gonna encourage you to take a look at that now, but that effectively ends this unit. Uh, there's also some section 8.1 practice questions for you to take a look over. Um, but like I said, that effectively ends this unit. So I'll stop recording here and uh, I'll answer some questions that you might have.